Okay, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening. Uh, once again, welcome you to this World Lot River and the Delta System Source to Sync webinar series. So today is Friday. Uh, we invite Professor Anna Bernhardt from uh, Free University of Berlin to give a talk about South America, the Chile mountain. So before I introduce Anna, so I would like to see next week, next Wednesday, you know, our old friend, uh, Steve Q from Virginia Institute of Marine Science. He will talk about the sediment and the carbon delivery and the preservation of the Amazon Ganges Bumaputra Ayavadi Sovereign River. So please mark your calendar. And also Friday, uh, next Friday, um, Rebecca Cardville from Sharing um, uh, Energy Technology Company she will talk about the global delta data set and uh, also the predicted delta formation on marine uh, coastal line. I think uh, both talk uh, will be also very interesting. Please do come back. So Anna, as you can see, um, originally she graduated also from uh, the Free University of Berlin and then get a PhD in 2011, uh, I guess he spent um, five or six years in San Francisco, uh, Stanford University, uh, the PhD over there. And after that, he back to Germany, has a couple post uh, two postdoc, and then become professor 2000, uh, 2016 in the Free University of Berlin over there. So uh, uh, Anna, uh, involved in the research in South America, both Atlantic side and the Pacific side. So today she will talk about the active margin of the Chile margin and so uh, pretty sedimentary routing. So Anna, uh, now is your turn. Please share your screen. Yes, I will. Are you okay seeing my yeah, screen? Good. Oh, very good, perfect. go ahead. Well, thank you very much for, for um, this introduction and also for putting together this um, bi-weekly seminar that you know we already said so in the chat before that really helps us going through these crazy times and um, there, where many of us actually work in isolation for quite a bit. However, well, I will take you today to the Chile margin and we will talk to land to ocean sediment um, routing in these, this area. And especially we, I will be talking about testing the effects of climatic and geomorphic boundary conditions here. And I would like to acknowledge my co-authors, which are Wolfgang Schwanghardt and Manfred Strecker from the University of Potsdam, where I did my postdoc and Dirk Hebeln and Maiha Mutadi, who work at the Marum Research Center in Bremen, and Jan Beren Stud, who's at the NIOS in the Netherlands. And whoop, here we go. So we've been seeing several talks that talk about very big river system, about, about global sediment export from those rivers into the oceans. And we, um, and actually next week, Steve Kuhl will talk about the giants again, including the Amazon basin in here. And so you can see that the, the right side or the east side of the South American continent is drained by this really big systems that discharge a lot of sediment into the ocean. That's the Amazon sediment plume here. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, and you can, see, you can see that massive amount of sediment that's washed into the Atlantic here. But today I would actually like to invite you to look at the little guys here over um, along the Indian margin on the western side of the continent that discharge sediment into the Pacific Ocean. And you can see here a couple of, um, well, bigger Chilean rivers in central Chile. This is the Maule River, and this is the infamous Bio Bio River, one of the largest river systems here in Chile. And they also discharge quite a significant amount of sediment into the Pacific Ocean here in this particular image during flooding stage in July 2006. 
And if we look at the global scale, this is the compilation of Milliman and Farnsworth. We have seen this already in many talks, including Paul's introduction talk a couple of weeks ago. And this shows the annual sediment discharge from rivers into the coastal ocean. And we can see that the Andean side here of Western South America does discharge about 530 million tons per year. And that is um, quite significant. And it's even by a factor of four times more than the southern part of the eastern side, side can do. So this is not insignificant, even though these are little. However, they drain very steep ca uh, catchments and can actually free a bunch of sediment here. So this talk will be structured as followed. We, um, I will introduce the Chilean margin to you as, um, and I will explain why we use it as a natural laboratory or what I even mean with this. Then we will talk about fluvial sediment supply and offshore deposition. I mostly work in marine sediments, so my perspective is a little bit more focused on the sink part of the sediment routing system. But nevertheless, we will talk about short and long-term fluvial sediment supply and how this behaves along this margin. We will talk about long-term sediment deposition in the trench and um, about Holocene turbotide systems and how much sediment those receive um, along this particular area. We will then focus on sediment export under changing climate and geomorphic conditions, as I promised earlier. And then I will quickly talk about the questions that still remain open here in this area and how we are trying to address this in ongoing and future work. And if you get lost along the way, there's a sidebar here on the, um, on the right hand side. So then, you know, it will pop up where we are actually in the talk. So if you're lost, you can get back on track here. Okay, zooming into Chile, this is the longest and skinniest country probably there is. And first, by looking at the simple um, real color landslide image, you can see that it's um, vegetation is quite sparse here in the north, and then it gets progressively greener towards the south. You can also see that this is a subduction system. You know that anyways, but this is the subduction trench here offshore. And you can also sort of guess that this is getting deeper um, towards the north. And this is because there's actually a small amount of sediment fill towards the north. And we will look at this in a bit more detail. So let's zoom into this particular area of central Chile, that's where most of my work is actually based, and look at the um, climatic situation here. And on this part, I plotted the um, present-day precipitation uh, pattern in here, where hot colors are low precipitation and cold colors are high precipitation. And you can see as we go down here towards the south, precipitation increases um, as we go down south. So it's quite dry up here and it becomes progressively wetter or more humid down here. And if you look at a, uh, a couple of pictures, just to get an image of how that landscape looks like, this is a semi-arid um, region, the Santa Gracia National, National Reserve, um, close to the city of La Serena. This is a semi-arid climate zone, and you can see some patchy vegetation here, smaller scrubs, and um, lots of bare ground where sedi uh, sediment might be relatively or readily available for erosion. Moving down south a little bit in the area of Valparaiso into the La Campana National Park, we'll see that vegetation is more abundant. There are some um, palm trees in here. The vegetation cover down here in the valley is actually quite dense. On the hill slopes, there's still some bare ground um, that is not covered by vegetation. And then we, if we go even further down south here, that's the, that's the mouth of the, Rio, um, of the Rio Bio Bio. And we can see that here, the landscape is actually covered by quite dense forest. So that climatic gradient, of course, because there is more precipitation towards the south has a clear impact on the vegetation pattern here. Good, so we use the Chile margin as a natural laboratory uh, on the spatial scale. Um, 
And uh, what I mean by that is that we can use this um, pronounced climate gradient to analyze the effect of changing climatic zones on sediment export to the ocean. So we, we are defining a couple of study sites along this particular gradient to see how sediment export works along this climate gradient. Um, this is, well, data, this is the modeled suspended sediment yield um, per square kilometer in the uh, catchment. It is not real data. This is an outcome of the Bogart model that has been introduced actually just Wednesday by um, Albert Kettner and earlier by Jaya Savitsky in the same seminar. And so what they do is they model the, um, um, the suspended sediment uh, outflux from the um, from rivers and they actually the, the model is quite well um, calibrated so we can sort of trust these values um, uh, quite confidently and as you can see the um, sediment yield of the, from the Bogart model is steadily increasing here towards the south and then it really shows a bunch of scatter it seems to peak maybe down here but there's not a, uh, necessarily a clear padding in here and this fluvial sediment yield is pre-human so we do not uh, looking at human effects here but um, and it averages about you know several decades if we look at longer term sediment yield and this, uh, these values are derived from cosmogenic nuclide measurements of 10 beryllium that um, quantify erosion rates. And using these erosion rates, we can calculate the sediment yield for each basin. And um, this is a compiled data set, mostly of um, data from Cartier, um, 2013, and actually follow-up papers as well. And they um, sampled the outland of catchments just at the foothill of the Andes because they were interested in the ocean pattern in the high Andes um, themselves. And then we added um, a few data points along the mouth of the major river systems as we are more interested in what comes actually out of the mouth of the river and gets discharged into the ocean. And what you can see here is that there's an increase in, sed uh, in sediment yield towards these latitudes. And then, you know, given the sparse data, but it seems to decrease towards the south. So if we plot this up in, in a simpler plot, the open diamonds um, are the values, the short-term values from the Bogart model. And they show a bunch of scatter, but it seems to peak, they seem to peak here at 34 degrees south. And then they sort of go back down if you want, but there's a bunch of scatter. If we look at the longer term sediment yields that integrate over several millennia, we can see that these peak at 35, uh, 34 degrees about, and then they actually do go back down. So the annual or the decadal and the millennial scale sediment yields do not simply increase with increasing humidity. Just because it's, it's waning more, it doesn't mean that there's more sediment coming out of those river mouths but they peak in this Mediterranean climate, climate zone of, um, around 34 degrees south. And there are several working hypotheses that have been put forward that could explain or partly explain this pattern. Cartier et al. Um, interprets this as the, um, well, they also show that the erosion pattern increases non-linearly uh, linearly with mean slope. And they interpret this as a transient response to uplift pattern. So as the Andes are uplifting and it's waning more in the south, um, erosion can actually um, shallow the slopes relatively efficiently. And now the slopes down here in the mountainous areas are actually quite low. So now erosion rates have actually decreased. Whereas here in the Mediterranean uh, climate zones, the slopes have not adjusted yet and erosion rates are still quite high. There's also a recent paper by Jessica Starke. She um, focuses a little bit more to, um, to the north, but also includes some of these data. And she should uh, suggest a bidirectional res response of, of erosion to the influence of vegetation. So um, uh, what they're showing is that there are competing interaction between precipitation and vegetation on erosion in each setting and depending on who wins vegetation as a stabilizer or precipitation as an eroding agent, um, this might drive the pattern. 
So there are several you know, interesting working hypotheses out there that are tested in further research. Now, if we look at a third um, proxy of sediment flux over the very long term, we actually do see a different pattern. So what this plot shows is the sediment volume that's deposited in the subduction trench out here. So this is work of David Ferker in 2013, and he looked at a bunch of seismic reflection profiles that crossed the trench, and he calculated the, uh, the volume of sediment that's trapped in the trench. And so this integrates about um, one over about one million years as the oldest sediments in the trench are sort of dated. There's actually no, no, no dueling in here, but they are suggested to be about one million years old. So this is the really long-term sediment flux. And as you can see, that uh, actually does increase steadily towards the south. There might be some local influence of, that is determined by the position of submarine canyons and adjacent rivers, but in generally there's an increase in sediment fill in the trench towards the north. Uh, the south, I'm sorry. And so what that means is that the sediment volume here sort of does um, positively correlate with the increase in precipitation down this margin. And um, here we are seeing the bathymetry um, offshore the Chilean margin, so we can look at the trench a little bit better. And you can sort of see that the trench is filled here down in the south, and as you go towards the north, the trans, uh, trans, trench becomes deeper and it's also less smooth, so there's less sediment in here. You can already tell by the, by the bathymetry. And because of that local gradient where these, the entire trench is slightly tilted towards the north, there's also sediment transport going on here that's directed towards the north. So there's an axial channel, a nice a turbidite channel in here that um, uh, that is that continues over several hundred uh, kilometers and then actually tapers out in here. Let's zoom into this a little bit so we can appreciate it a little bit more. This is the super nice um, channel here within the trench that funnels sediment towards the north. And then if we zoom into this northern part, we can still see that channel running along. And then we are actually getting into the realm where the Juan Fernandez, which is subducted um, underneath the South American continent, I'm sorry. And, um, and the trench is actually not filled anymore and the turbulent channel is also not present anymore. So as you can see that this, uh, this whole depositional system here offshore is a very open system. So sediment can uh, be deposited along the continental slope. You can see that the continental slope here in this realm is characterized by the big four arc basin that's sediment filled, but also a bunch of smaller basins that are um, nested within this accretionary prism here. There's a few large submarine canyons that can funnel sediment directly into the trench, but there's also these little mini basins that can store sediment. That's similar here in the south, there's a big um, canyon going down the continental slope directly delivering sediment to the trench, but also many um, different mini basins that can fill up with sediment. So we cannot use this natural laboratory to actually close sediment budgets, right? It can go anywhere, it can go in the little basins, it can go along the canyon, and then it can actually go northward within the trench because of this regional gradient. So this is something we cannot do, but we quantify or semi-quantify the sediment input by using individual um, gravity cores. Okay, and since we are already talking about the onshore and offshore um, geomorphology of this margin and how this changes along the gradient, let's look at, uh, into this a little bit more. This is a block diagram here of the northernmost area. Those uh, dots are gravity cores that we used for the studies I will introduce a little later on. And um, we can see that the, the onshore gradients are quite steep and the rivers drain the high Andes. And then the shelf is actually quite narrow. So you can also appreciate this in this map where the shelf edge is shown by this um, gray line. And here in the north, the shelf is really very narrow to almost absent. 
So sediment during Holocene sea level high stand cannot be efficiently stored on along this very narrow shelves. However, if we go to the south, we see that the shelf actually increases in width quite a bit. And this is the block diagram here in the south. You see those big canyons coming down the canyon, the uh, intra basin or the interslope basins here, and a shelf that's up to 60, maximum 80 kilometers wide. So this is this is not wide when you look at passive margins where there can easily easily be 200 kilometers wide, but um, in this case along the Chile subduction margin, this is actually quite wide. Good. And to constrain um, offshore depositional patterns and sediment flux, we used a bunch of sediment gravity cores and we looked at the sedimentation rates, but also at the frequency of turbidite deposits. So how often did the turbidity current come down the slope and actually exported coarse grained or sand sized sediment um, along the slope here. And we split it uh, our estimates here in uh, different time periods, the Holocene, the deglacial, and the last glacial maximum. But for now, we will just um, focus on the yellow dots, which represent the Holocene. And as you can see here in the semi-arid northernmost area, um, the Holocene turbidite frequencies, which are given here in turbidites per thousand years, are actually quite low. So there's almost no turbidites coming down um, into the marine rearm here, and also not doing the same semi-arid um, within this, uh, this, this study site, which is actually of Mediterranean climate. So um, the, the peak in, in erosion rates, we can't actually see that in the turbidites down here in this particular fork basin. If we go down here to the south, we actually see um, turbidite frequency up to eight turbidites um, per thousand years and these rates are or this frequency are, frequencies are highly variable because that really depends on the depositional site you're sampling. So similar pattern where we just look at the sedimentation rates within those cores, very low sedimentation rates all along here and then these shoot up to very high actually more than five meters per thousand years offshore the southern Chilean um, margin here. So in the north, there's little to no activity of turbidity currents that export sediment to, into the ocean during the Holocene, uh, even though the shelf is very narrow and to almost absent, right? So there's, it's not because this, the sediment is actually stored on the shelf during the current Holo Holocene high stand. Uh, it's simply not delivered to the margin anymore. And here in the south, turbidity current um, activity transports sand, silt, and mud to the deep ocean, even though the shelf is quite wide and the sediment, if it's not directly funneled into a canyon, the sediment could, could be stored on, on these relatively wide shelves. So there must be, or there should be a, um, a mechanism that actually drives this. And in order to highlight this me uh, mechanism, let's have a quick look at the current, current patterns or the large scale current patterns. Um, offshore Chile, there's two surface currents that are directed towards the north, which is the Chilean coastal current and the infamous to Chile current or the Humboldt current that brings cold water from the polar region towards the north. However, there's also a southward directed current, which is not a surface current, but an undercurrent that flows at around 200 to 400 meters of water depth. And we will zoom into this area offshore Concepcion uh, to look at some high resolution bathymetry of the shelf here that gives us clues into what's actually going on here. And this shows you that uh, the Bio Bio River actually discharges directly into the head of a submarine canyon, the Bio Bio submarine canyon. So um, much of that Bio Bio river sediment can be directly funneled into the trench as the canyon leads directly into the trench. Um, that still doesn't necessarily explain us the high sedimentation rates or the relatively high turbidite frequencies in uh, on the continental slope. 
So let's zoom into the inner shelf here. And when we do this, this is very high resolution bathymetry. The, um, it's about two meters per grid cell, so much higher than our usual bathymetry out there. And we can see that the inner shelf is actually quite smooth, and we um, interpret this as being covered by loose sediment. However, if we zoom into the outer shelf area here, we see a completely different pattern. So this is, uh, out here is the shelf edge. You could sort of guess those um, gullies that start incising into the sh shelf edge here. And um, we see a bunch of rigid bedrock ridges that are partly faulted. And this rigid um, surface is partly covered by these smooth areas, which we interpret as loose sediments. And you can see that the sediment is reshaped into those elongate sediment drifts um, here, for example, but it's also winnowed out or eroded into these scours here. The direction of the scours sort of implies a southwestward direction, sediment transport directions, direction of this, of the sediment. And the Gunther undercurrent actually um, coincides with the depth of the shelf here um, and transports the sediment or sweeps this loose sediment over the sh shelf edge or into those gullies or onto the continental slope and, um, and causes these high sedimentation rates and also delivers sediment in order to trigger turbidity currents offshore here. Okay, so to summarize this part, offshore north central Chile, the low sediment supply actually pre uh, precludes uh, significant sediment export to the sea uh, or to the continental slope. It's not very surprising, um, but that is the case, although the shelf is narrow and the offshore gradients are steep. So there's still intermittent storage of sediment happening here. However, offshore south central Chile, we have the um, positive pairing of high sediment supply and um, a white shelf, but the sediment doesn't stay on that white shelf, at least not in this outer part, because the water depth of that shelf, uh, of the outer shelf coincides with the Gunther undercurrent that is fast enough or strong enough to actually export sediment um, over the shelf edge and sweeps it onto the um, continental slope. So we get high sedimentation rates here, even though sea level is high during the Holocene. So in general, white shelves do not necessarily preclude the delivery of terrigenous sediment to the deep ocean during um, sea level high stand. In fact, the export of sediment to the deep ocean via undercurrents can be especially efficient during high stands when these currents flow along flooded sediment covered continental shelves. And we really need to make sure that we integrate those uh, three dimensional aspects into sediment ba mass balances and budgets and in our depositional models when we look at you know, deeper time strata. And this is actually quite similar to the scenario along the Nile River and the Levang margin that was introduced by Uri Shatner's talk a few way, uh, weeks back, where he also showed that the, the Nile sediment can be transported towards the Israeli coast via um, strong currents only when sea level is high and the shelf is actually flooded. So this is not a unique situation, but might be quite um, common. Good. So I um, talked about why we can use the Chilean continental margin as a natural laboratory on the spatial scale using this climate gradient, but we can also use it um, as a natural lab laboratory on the temporal scale. And so we can use the well-defined climate change from the last glacial maximum to present to analyze the effects of changing climate on sediment export to the ocean in different climate zones over time. And what actually happened here is um, the following. So we have the semi-arid study site up here in La Serena, um, a Mediterranean study site offshore uh, Valparaiso and then a humid study site down here just south of Concepcion. 
And the reason why it's humid down in Chile, it's because the westerly winds, they blow onto the continents in these latitudes and they bring um, moisture from the Pacific Ocean onto the continent. And during the last glacial maximum, the core of the westerlies was actually moved towards the north by about five degrees. And so the, um, with this, the entire precipitation gradient was actually shifted towards the north by five degrees. So along our study sites here, everything got wetter or more humid. And after the LGM and during the deglacial, the westerly or uh, westerlies or the core of the westerlies actually shifted back down for about these five degrees. So in during the deglacial, everything became drier along this, um, uh, this margin because the entire gradient was shifted back south. So we are talking about you know, a climatic change towards um, less humid conditions in all of those distinct climatic zones. So the research question we are trying to answer here is how is the deglacial aridification manifested in marine clastic deposits under changing climatic and geomorphic boundary conditions? And in order to understand how we developed our working hypotheses, I uh, would like to introduce you to two very you know, quick um, concepts. And the first one refers to how cyclic, uh, cyclical precipitation changes are thought to propagate into sedimentary sinks. And there's a bunch of numerical models out there that predict how this might work. And we are looking at an input signal here, which is the water discharge or changing precipitation, if you want, and the sedimentary response in terms of sediment supply here. And if you pick a diffusive one-dimensional model of Armitage, um, he showed that, well, if the cyclicity is quite, or the periodicity of the cyclicity is quite, um, quite high, sediment flux may respond during the first few cycles, and then it just sort of tapers out, and you don't actually see a signal in the sedimentary sink anymore. There are other models out there that um, propose the opposite, that such signal might be amplified in the erosional zone, or if you pick yet another model by Simpson and Castletor, it might be amplified by river transport feedbacks, meaning that if you put more water into the system than within the transport uh, zone, which in larger river systems, you can remobilize more sediment from this floodplain because there's more water available and you can amplify the sediment supply signal. So depending on which model you choose or which model you think is more most applicable to your study area, you might not see a signal or you might see a signal. And we would be just looking really at the, that precipitation decrease during the deglacial just as a half cycle if you want. The second concept I would like to introduce is the concept of connectivity. And connectivity describes um, how efficient a certain portion of sediment can be transferred from one compartment, from, from, from one part of the sediment routing system to the next. And um, generally, um, systems or sediment routing system is highly connected when a, a high amount of sediment can actually make it through. So here in that northern or study uh, site, the onshore gradients are quite steep. You can see that on this onshore slope map. Um, then the shelf is narrow to absent. I talked about this earlier. And then the core locations that we are looking at are here within the continental uh, along the continental slope because there's very little sediment out there in the trench. And so we think that this system up, or the systems up here are highly connected. And another term that we use for this is um, that these are reactive system and it's a term coined by Philip Allen in 2008. The geomorphology looks quite different if we look at the south here where the gradients are steep in the Andes, but then you get into the zone of the central valley, which obviously has low gradients because it's a valley. And because the, the coastal cordillera, um, we get, uh, go onto this wide shelf, the equationary uh, prism out here is quite big. So it has a bunch of smaller inter, 
um, inter basins in here. And then the core locations we chose are actually out here in the trench and on the incoming plate because the sedimentation rates are so high on the accretion prism or on the continental slope that we, um, within gravity course, we never captured the last glacial, glacial maximum actually. So um, the uh, distinct geomorphology is due to um, a steeper subduction angle out here. So there's active volcanism as well. And then that big central valley that develops here. There's also a bunch of glacial lakes over deep in glacial valleys here at the foothill of the Andes. So we think that this uh, system is less connected and therefore more buffered. So there's a decrease in connectivity because the gradient is decreasing, but there's also an increasing size of potential transient sediment sinks towards the south. And these includes the glacial lakes, the Great Valley, the white shelves, but also the endoslope basins on the slope here. So the working hypothesis that we came up with is that um, the deglacial precipitation decrease is probably most prominently preserved in the marine records offshore that northernmost semi-arid study, uh, study set because it's a very reactive sediment routing system and that the signal or the um, sedimentary change due to climate change will be much less uh, pronounced and occur with a significant lag time in that humid study site where the system is more buffered. So let's see if that's actually true. So what we did now is we took a bunch of sediment cores that were caught by the RV zone, but um, we also included an ODB core. We quantified turbidite frequency and thickness in here. We took a bunch of previous studies and um, extracted the paleoclimatic proxies from here that constrain the climatic change. We computed or we computed the age depth model to quantify the age uncertainties because we want to compare the timing of the environmental change or the climate change to the marine turbidite record. This is the first glimpse at the data. I'm leaving out this um, intermediate study site for, for time constraints, but we can see in this northernmost study site, that's this orange curve of here, and this is turbidite frequency now in turbidites per 500 years against age. And we can see that around 16 to 15,000 years before present, the turbidite frequency drops quite significantly here in the northern study site. And it does so a little bit earlier at the humid uh, study site. There's a steep decline in turbidite frequencies in the course that we looked at. Now, we want to compare the uh, change in an offshore turbidite depositional pattern to environmental change proxies. And so we come up with these plots. No worries, I'm not going to get into this detailed plot. But we basically want to um, compare the timing of curve change for different proxies um, towards our sedimentary record. Oops. And this becomes quite messy if you look at this. Uh, uh, this way, and we also need to quantify the uncertainties, so this is not a great way to look at this. And we try to come up with a more intuitive way, which um, I hope I can explain in here. So we, um, we plotted the age models against the proxy of interest, be it be turbidite record or whatever climate proxy. And we did that for each Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation out of the H models. So when you model um, H depth models with the Bacon R software of the blog, then um, it actually does that by modeling many, many thousands Monte Carlo um, Markov chain Monte Carlo simulations. So we took each one of these and we determined first the steepest or the, the maximum change within the curve, which is the steepest gradient of the proxy curve. Those are the black dots. And then we also quantified the temporal duration of proxy curve change. So that means when the curve changes its gradient and back again. So that's the temporal duration of the change in the proxy. And we did this for every Monte Carlo simulation. Oops, now this is going crazy. And, um, and we just got rid of the curve and um, remained with the quantification of the steepest change or the maximum change and the temporal duration of this change. So what you're going to see from now on is black dots um, and the duration in a gray bar. So we did this for all the proxies and our um, sedimentary proxies. So the black dots, again, are the maximum change. The gray bars are the temporal duration of this change. And we can see that turbidite frequency in this northernmost study area declines quite steeply around 16 to 15,000 years 
for present and the temporal um, duration of this change um, actually goes on to, until about 11,000 years before present. Turbulent thickness takes a bit longer. And if we compare this to humidity proxies in different sites, but also offshore proxies, we can see that the changes in proxies and the changes in the turbidite record occur contemporaneously at the same time with similar dura durations. So um, within the resolution of the, um, of the edge models. And down here, we can look at um, sea level that also changes, of course, but it wouldn't have uh, too much of an impact up here because the shelf is narrow to absent. Now, by looking at the south, we can see this very steep decline in turbidite frequency. Um, a little bit earlier, about 17,000 uh, or so before present and that occurs very abruptly. And it also uh, uh, occurs temporaneously with the changes in proxy. So these are pollen changes. This even slightly postdates this maybe a little bit, at least in the steepest gradient. But the other proxies are just in line with the change in turbidite frequency. So it, everything happens at the same time. So our working hypothesis that, you know, this deglacial precipitation decrease is most prominently preserved just in the northern study site is actually not necessarily true because we can see that the spatial temporal, temporal turbidite pattern mirrors the deglacial humidity decrease and the warming that comes with it over a wide range of climate zones and geomorphic settings. So basically all three sites that um, we tested lag times are not resolvable, so they might be present, but they must be below the resolution of our age models. And turbidite decline is not mainly controlled by post-glacial sea level rise, as in the southern um, study area, sea level rise actually post-dates the change in turbidity currents. And in the semi-arid side, we think that high system connectivity or reactivity is responsible for the rapid manifestation of the glacial arid, uh, aridification here in, you know, seen in the decrease in offshore turbidite deposition. So this is in agreement with our um, working hypothesis. However, the south seems to be functioning somehow differently. And here the um, turbidites shut off um, also, at, uh, at the same time as the proxies show the steepest change or the steepest climatic change. And we think this is actually due to a different process, or at least partly due to a different process. Um, once we look down here at the map, we can see there's a couple of really big lakes that intersect the river systems down here. Those are over deep in glacial uh, um, valleys that have been flooded by meltwater. And this is the um, Bierica. A volcano here in the background of one of those lakes. So of course these lakes became partly ice-free during, during the deglacial as well. So all of a sudden you open up this big um, efficient sediment trap in um, at the foothills of the Andes which swallows a whole bunch of sediment that then doesn't make it out to the uh, to our core locations anymore. So that would actually mean that this is a decrease in connectivity in the system that's in the end responsible for signal propagation um, offshore. So we conclude that high connectivity, um, but also a rapid loss of system connectivity within the sediment routing systems can result in rapid manifestation of a climate signal in the downstream sedimentary system. And it may create meaningful and quite similar stratigraphic patterns in the sink. So for us as sedimentologists or stratigraphists, that's quite encouraging because we can um, see in, in this particular area that climate change is um, recorded in the sediment um, depositional patterns offshore. So the uh, turbulent deposition is dramatically reduced during the same time as um, the proxies indicate the climate change um, in all study sites along the entire gradient. And that is, of course, encouraging because that's what we usually try to do as sedimentologists, right? We try to take a sedimentary record and invert it into changes in the upland um, river catchments. And so, you know, even though this is this is quite quite a nice result, as I think, 
Um, the, the really interesting question behind this is the following. So what are the sequence of processes that actually lead to this reduction of sediment supply, especially when we think about the northern area? Does first chemical weathering reduce and then because there's less loose um, material available, erosion will reduce? And that leads into the um, decreased export of sediment? Or is it simply that we don't have enough water in the rivers uh, that, um, the, that decreases the, the river transport capacity? And so there's sediment available on shore, it just cannot be transported offshore anymore. And how does this sequence of you know, different processes that change in the sequence with climate change um, differ between climate zones? And this is a question that we are trying to address in a, um, in a project that just started about a year ago. And this project is part of the larger research consortium, which is called Earth Shape. It's a German Chilean research initiative that aims at looking at how microorganisms, animals and plants, so biota, influences the shape and development of, Earth's, of the Earth's surfaces. And uh, Earth shape as well is uh, making use of the steep climate gradient along the Chilean margin to look at the influence of biota on the Earth's surface. And the project that we have within this you know, bigger research framework is called the Seco Chile project. And that includes the coupled vegetation, weathering, erosion, and sediment export response to climate change. And we take a bunch of relatively novel proxies to constrain these. So PIs are Hella Wittmann, Dirk Daxe, and Patrick Frings from the GFC Potsdam and myself. And then we have two very talented PhD students. That is Charlotte Leuchli down here and Nestor Gaviria, who are taking up this challenge. And the philosophy behind this project is um, such as we know that precipitation is um, changing from the LGM to the Holocene over the deglacial. And what we would like to constrain is how does the hydrology change um, afterwards, which we constrain by delta deuterium in um, leaf waxes. Then we are interested in how the vegetation changes after that precipitation changes. We would hypothesize that it takes a little bit of a lag time for the vegetation to change, but not much. And we um, also measure a bunch of uh, parameters in leaf wax biomarkers to constrain this. Then we look at the change in um, chemical weathering by looking at lithium isotopes. And we would hypothesize that uh, chemical weathering changes after, after the vegetation change. We will then look at erosion rates and paleo erosion rates look at, um, using cosmogenic nuclides. And then we already constrained the sediment or the change of sediment export to the ocean. So we really want to get at the sequence of processes um, that are happening here. And this is a first glimpse of the types of data that Charlotte and Nestor are acquiring those days. And I won't go too much into the details of this, this particular data. I just want to show the concept of the study. And they sampled soil and river sediment on shore. And they also um, have a bunch of surface sediment cores offshore um, that uh, can be used to um, calibrate those novel proxies. And then Charlotte actually takes marine gravity core to look at um, the, the sedimentary record from the last glacial maximum to present to really look at how this climate change evolved in, in this particular course. And in order to do this, these proxies actually have to be calibrated in modern sediment along the margin. And this is what's shown here. The proxy that I'm plotting here against latitude is the average chain length of N alkanes. So this is the number of carbon atoms in, um, in N alkanes of higher plants. So how many you know, carbons are within this uh, one compound. And you can see that this particular proxy is actually most sensitive here in the north, where we transition from the arid to a semi-arid site. And then it becomes um, sort of scattered and maybe a little, bit, a little bit less sensitive once we get into the humid area. So we are looking at these types of proxy vessels that we 
threshold that we can then apply to the paleo worker to really constrain what happened in terms of these uh, surface processes in the past following the um, LGM to present climate change. All right, so the take home points um, just very generally are basically that the Chile margin can be used as a natural laboratory to um, analyze the response of sediment routing systems to changing climatic and geomorphic boundary conditions. And we can do that in space in the modern uh, world and also back in time by tracing this past climate change. Millennial scale erosion rates and sediment flux show the response of a transient landscape, uh, landscape whereas the million year sediment flux generally increases with the modern day um, precipitation gradient. And during the Holocene, the river sediment input and shelf bottom currents control the sediment supply to the continental slope and trench. And it's really the interplay of the two. You need to have high sediment input, but you also uh, need those undercurrents in order to increase the, your sedimentation rates on the continental slope. The glacial climate change is reliably reserved in marine sediment archives on the continental slope, and that is true for a wide range of climate zones. So all the study sites that we tested show that same thing. However, the geomorphology of the onshore catchment plays a very important role in this type of signal propagation, and distinct geomorphic processes can result in the same stratigraphic pattern. So you need to watch out which geomorphic process you actually want to invert from your sedimentary record. All right, and with this, I will leave you with this beautiful image here from the um, Bio Bio River uh, mouth that discharges sediment directly into the big Bio Bio Canyon that gets funneled towards the trench here. And I'm very happy to take your questions. Oh, fantastic. Thank you very much, Anna. And so let's see if uh, from the uh, audience, if any question, you know, Tom Bionti left a message, a uh, question he has, he has to left uh, earlier for other meeting. So Anna, could you click the chat and see the question, read the question? Yeah, wait, I, I have to, ah, here's the chat. Okay. Yes. So there's a question from Rimal. Do you think lithology also could have some control on the sediment flux variation in the st study area? Um, yes, I, I, I think there's definitely a lithology control. We do not have a good idea on how, in, in terms of you know, quantification, how the lithology controls sediment flux. Um, if you look at the um, nature and the texture of the sediment offshore, you can definitely see the, inf uh, the, um, uh, the influence of the, of the catchment lithologies. So in the north, it's mostly plutonic rocks also from the coastal cordillera that um, provide sediment for this, for this area. So you see um, um, higher grain sizes if there is any coarse grain sediment because there's quartz in um, those plutonic rocks and feldspar as well. Whereas in the south, uh, there's active volcanism going on, right? Because the subduction, um, the subduction angle is still um, is, is steeper down there. You can actually melt the crust and have um, active volcanism. So we see a whole, uh, we see generally finer grain sizes and higher amounts of mud in there because volcanic, those volcanic and acidic rocks preferably weather into um, finer grain sizes and they don't form um, a whole lot of sand really. So yes, that okay. would be the short answer, I guess. Okay, uh, Anna, uh, could you also see the, the up one, uh, the Tom, Tom Bianchi's one? Oh, there's, there's one more down here. He asked, uh, you know, in addition to the in addition to glacial lakes, how about the void also contribute to the buffering effect and how important earthquake, earthquakes in contributing to turbidites? Yes, um, so this is, this is a very good um, a question that if we really two questions in one, right? And so I haven't um, talked much about the fjord area at all. Um, 
Um, do you st still see my screen, Noah? Yes. Oh, okay. okay. Then let me enhance this. It gave me a funny message here. Um, so if you look at the coastline down in here, and remember our southernmost study site was somewhere in here, but um, if we go down here, you can see that this entire coastline is heavily influenced by glaciation. Um, during the last glacial maximum and earlier, you can still see the remnants of the ice sheet here, the um, southern Patagonian ice sheets that are used to carve hey, those are, you, hmm? are you sharing your screen? Oh, okay. Um, let's see. It gave me a funny message, so I wasn't sure. Um, here we go. Are you seeing it now? Yes. Great. Uh, so again, our study area, uh, the southernmost study area was somewhere in here, but then um, this region is highly influenced by glaciation from the remnants of the uh, ice sheet down here. And so there's a bunch of fjords. And of course, much of the sediment here is trapped in those fjords. So if you actually look at the, the, the trench fill volume as you go further down to the south, the volume actually decreases again. I didn't show, uh, show that to you because it wasn't the focus of the study, but um, the trench volume actually goes back down and that is because a lot of the, uh, uh, the sediment actually stays within those, uh, within those fjords. So there's definitely a um, influence of that. And then I have to look up the, the second question here because my chat window is gone. Elizabeth. Uri, could you go ahead and ask your question, Uri? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hi, Uri. Ah, hi. Great talk, thank you. Um, can you explain a little bit more about the long, sh a long shore, a long margin currents, how they uh, contribute? Because it's um, it, the, the margin is quite uh, narrow and um, uh, I, I don't really understand if the sediments arrive into the margin and then they go from one region with one climate to, to the other, how, how it affects the sedimentation. Um, well, we also don't actually know that, unfortunately. Um, so what we need in order to constrain this better would be um, more high resolution bathymetry on the shelf. However, the data set I showed you is the only one we have. It was shot after the 2008 Maule earthquake in that region to see if there's fault ruptures on the shelf. And so um, the only thing that we do have is measurements out there. So ADCP measurements that show that the um, undercurrent is actually flowing along the outer shelf towards the south. And we see the response of the loose sediment um, on the outer shelf. So what we think is happening is that there's those big sediment plumes that I showed at, at the beginning that, um, that hemipelagically distribute sediment over the shelf and then that gets reshaped by um, this current. The amount we don't actually know. Um, we, you know it's, it's quite logical that the influence should get less towards the north just because the shelf is not very, very wide, so there's not much sediment to be retransported here. But in the south, it should be quite significant. We also know that the Gunther undercurrent, that's the name of that current, um, flows um, quite a long ways until you know the southern part of, of uh, southern Chile as well. So we think it has an influence, but we can't quantify it without that type of data. Mm -hmm. But it seems like because sedimentation rates are so high on the continental slope that up to almost six meter, meters during the Holocene, um, per, six meters per thousand years, um, this, is, this is really high. So you need a process that, um, that uh, gets it down there. And the connection of submarine canyons and rivers, like the Bio Bio Canyon that I showed, this is just an explanation for how you get sediment into the trench, but not onto the small basins in, in the continental slope. So we think it's important. However, we can't quantify it due to the lack of data, which I guess is always the problem okay. in the I, ocean. Yeah. Wonderful. And uh, I have a couple of questions. Could you move to the slide, maybe the last slide, to show the Bio Bio River, the, the canyon? Yeah, also the very last one? Uh, yeah, so, oh, 
Uh, I might have to exit this because it's going to take too long. Good too. So my question, yes, this one. So my question is, this is on the shelf, in the shelf, right? Yes. So how deep of that canyon cut down here? Here on the shelf? Uh-huh. Um, I, I, I don't, we, we have a paper about it, and I would actually need to look this up, but it's several hundred meters. I'm not sure if it, no, several hundred meters. I'm not sure if actually it already cuts down to about a kilometer in this region, but it does along its pathway. So it's really, it's a big, big canyon. It's, if you were standing at the edge of it, you would be, um, you would be thinking Grand Canyon. <laughs> wow. And also the canyon head, all the way extend, almost connected to the estuary, to the river mouth, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, it's, uh, th that has been shown. So there's, we have a little bit of a data gap in here, so we can, uh, but this is just a couple of hundred meters. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it seems like it actually goes all the way back onto uh, the coast here. So it must have incised quite a bit in the Holocene as well. You can see this, um, this other um, canyon head over here. Mm -hmm. Um, which is located at a water depth of minus 120 meters. So this was connected to the coast during mm -hmm. the last glacial maximum when, the, when um, the, the sea level was low and this was actually all, this entire bay was land. So this used to be connected, but then this um, continued eroding backwards towards the, um, the, Bio Bio, uh, the, the, the river mouth. And okay. if you look at the, the canyon head very carefully in the higher resolution bathymetry, you can also see that there is bed forms, cyclic steps, that, um, that are um, thought to be formed by turbidity currents. So it yeah. seems like there's a direct discharge of turbidity currents in terms of maybe hyperpignal flows from the BOBO -Bio into that river, uh, into right. the canyon. Because, the, you know, the bed forms is uh, very commonly to see in the Monterey Bay Canyon. And exactly, this look exactly the same. Wonderful. So this is also just like the keys in, in southwestern Taiwan, they call the Goping Canyon. So the canyon had all the way connected to the river mouth. So that's a wonderful, maybe future can do a comparison study. So uh, yeah. I think, you know, the Gaoping Canyon is one of those crazy canyons because it re receives so much sediment uh, from this very steep slopes. Here, the, steep, uh, the slopes on shore are, are not that steep, but um, it seems to be enough to actually backward erode a canyon head and keep the ca a connection of, of the mouth. So yeah, yeah. These, these are very um, important canyons. There are not that many out there of this type, but I think they are absolutely key in um, sediment transport towards the ocean uh, during okay. sea level high stand. So you mentioned about the turbidity mainly around uh, 15,000 years ago, there's a high peak 15, 16,000 years ago. So how about the modern day? Could, is any modern sediment discharge to that subduction, you know, the trench? Do you have any evaluation, any estimate, how much those kind of riverine sediment reach to the trench, you know, the deep trench? Yeah. yeah, so we don't know in terms of quantities during the modern day. The problem is that the trench, uh, the water depth at the trench is, you know, five, 6,000 meters deep, and this is below the CCD. So you dissolve for a manifera um, below this, uh, at this water depth, which we use in order to date the sediment. So we have a severe trouble in dating sediment cores in the trench, just because you dissolve all the carbon that we use yeah. for C14 dating. Yeah, no, so know, maybe doesn't work, you know, at least some uh, more than, I don't know, 100 years ago is any, you know, like a lead to 10 is able to, I may be too slow, I don't know. Yeah. Is there any sediment trap? You know, people do any sediment trap for the, you know, over there. Uh, not that I know of. That would be a very interesting thing to do. And then 210 lead would, would definitely be another option. So there's a, st a study in this area onshore that determines sedimentation rates okay. on the shelf, which are quite high. But the trench is still missing. But I would absolutely love to do that. <laughs> it's deep. Okay. Yeah, I have more, I have more questions. Maybe we can ask you, uh, you know, uh, uh, after the meeting. But uh, OK, I have two more questions from Adelik. Adelik, do you want to speak? Adelik? 
Could you unmute yourself and uh, speak or? Uh, but Adelika's question is uh, how the weeds, you know, how wide of the canyon, you know, the one you just talked about. Yeah, well, this, this changes along the course of the canyon. And um, so uh, it's several hundred meters to even a kilometer wide um, uh, down, down in here. And then, of course, it's less wide when, when it comes to the, uh, to the coast. So there is a 2015 paper in geomorphology where we show all the different the, the development of the width and the depth of the canyon um, along its entire pathway. So if you're interested in the in the numbers along uh, its way, you can look that up in that paper or email me so I can send you a copy if you like. But it changes along the way, a couple of hundred meters at the most. Uh, at the most. Adelik, do you have more questions you want to see? Adelik? Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm Adelik. Um, yeah, I have a... I'm quite interested to look at this canyon. All right, um, I, I later possibly will email the, uh, with the speaker and I request maybe for more information. But another question I have is on the canyon floor, do you see any kind of deep pool uh, features, you know, evidence of uh, maybe some kind of turbulent, very turbulent flow that create deep pools? I don't see any deep pools or scours that you, you, mm -hmm. you are referring to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. scours, yes. Uh, yeah, I'm referring mm -hmm. to scours, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so what we do see is um, nick points in uh, okay. the canyon mm -hmm. pathway that, you know, that might retreat over a time, so that would be an indication of flow, but also those mm -hmm. crescent-shaped bed forms that um, Paul mentioned before, or cyclic steps that are pres mm -hmm. present in the uh, canyon, um, in the canyon yeah. head, indicate quite turbulent flow. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Mr. Tan, Chen Peng, do you want to speak your, out your question? Go ahead. Chen Peng. Yeah, I can also read the question. Yeah, okay, um, uh, the question is, the sediment flux to the ocean is much lower in the north semi-arid and I wondered if most of the sediment were just accumulated in the continent, such as the Piedmont area. So, um, yeah, that, that was one of the questions that we're addressing in further research. So if you look at, um, if you quantify, you know, sediment storage just from remote sensing digital elevation models, then it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of sediment stored in there. However, this doesn't an answer your questions because we need to date that sediment um, uh, in order to know how much uh, sediment is stored during the Holocene. So we don't actually know that yet. However, um, when you remember the geomorphology up there, there's over, over longer time scales, there's just not many sediment sinks up, up in there, right? There's not no deep valley, there are no big glacial lakes that actually can take up a whole lot of sediment. However, you can store sediment, of course, in the river valleys and also on the hill slopes. Um, that might just not be transported. So in, what we are testing in our new project is what's actually responsible for um, the decrease of sediment flux to the ocean during that um, climate change by looking at you know, whether it's really just transport capacity, if the rivers cannot transport that loose sediment down there anymore, or if it's simply not produced because you also reduce chemical weathering and erosion doing the aridification. So we are still in the testing phase of this. Mm, interesting. Thank you, Anna. So uh, Anna, you show, you show a lot of high resolution bathymetry, uh, multi-beam data, but uh, you didn't show uh, much seismic or chip sparker, you know, that kind of a sequence profile. Is uh, still processing or is some of your colleagues doing that part or? Um, so there's a bunch of um, uh, high resolution echo sounding that was mm -hmm. taken when the cores are um, taken and they haven't um, shown that that's correct. But the problem is that for my purposes, as I want to constrain the, the sediment flux offshore, it's not very useful in the sense that, you know, the system is so open. Even if you constrain the sediment flux to one small intraslow basin, you are not taking 
um, all the, un, uh, the other interslope basins into account. So okay. it's very questionable how much the, the analysis of, of this actually tells you about the entire sediment budget. Okay. Um, the trench fill, uh, fill volumes are based on deeper, you know, multi-channel seismic reflection data. Um, but yes, I haven't shown the, the, there, there is some, but for the purposes of the, the studies that I presented, it was just not very useful okay. because the slope is so dissected and there's so many little basins you could look yeah. at. <laughs> other, other crazy, crazy uh, thought. And uh, so during the, during the last maximum, during the glacial time, you know, the big ice sheet sitting mm -hmm. the mountain, how much the depth the deformation change, they could be pushed down the mountain, the land, on shore part. How much this deformation could be changed, the sediment routing, or even because the pressure coming down from, you know, the uplifting, is there any change the volcano earthquake activity? I mean, it's just crazy. I don't know how much that kind of Mm -hmm. So in terms of earthquakes, so one of the original um, ideas for, for this data set was to test whether we can reco uh, reconstruct past earthquakes mm -hmm. um, from, uh, from this particular, uh, from the turbidite record. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, it uh, turns out that there's many big earthquakes, to, for example, in the northern study areas do during the Holocene, uh, during historical times, so we have constraint on those, but they don't trigger turbidites. So we cannot, because there's not, a, not, not enough sediment delivered to the ocean margin, so you cannot trigger a turbidite, so you won't, you know, you won't get mass movement during, during earthquake shaking. Um, so this didn't um, quite work, work out well, uh, very well. And um, I guess what you are referring to in, in the, your second part of the question is um, the deformation that is caused by the subduction and how it determines the geomorphology, is that correct? Not the, the subduction, of course subduction can cause, but uh, during the glacial period, the big ice load. Oh, you know, the ice oh, Is that possible push up down the, the land portion? I, you know, I yes. don't know about that kind of geodynamic deformation. Yes, um, absolutely. So in, in, the, um, in the places that I looked at or that I showed you, actually, the, the, that was just the northern tip of the, the Patagonian ice shield. Ah. And even further north in the semi-arid study site, there was very minor gla glaciation in the, um, in the Andes. So I have not quantified the ice volumes or the isostatic rebound that might come with the glacial melting. However, this process is most probably much more important in the south, where the big fjords are, and the huge um, uh, Patagonian ice shield actually reached all the way towards the coast um, of the Pacific Ocean. So in this particular area that we are looked at, we think it's marginal, uh, uh, it's, it, it's not so important, but in the south, it will be very important as glaciation was massive down there in the fjord region. Well, very good, the time flies very quickly. Thank you, Anna, very, very, very much for this very interesting talk in that active Chile margin. I think uh, that we have more questions we can discuss later. And, uh, but once again, so next week, next Wednesday, Stu Q, and uh, next Friday, Rebecca will talk about the global uh, river and the deltas, sediment and the carbon. So please mark your calendar and come back. And so uh, thank you very much for today. And I hope, Eric, thank you, Anna. Thank you, all the audience. So still here. So I hope uh, you can have a great weekend.